I'm super excited to be joined by the one and only Jeremy Siskind here, live coming to you from Pasadena, California, in the Tone Base headquarters. Jeremy, thank you for joining us. It's always a pleasure. Happy to be here. And as you all know, we here at Tone Base uh, believe in accepting all musical styles, uh, even, not just even jazz. Even jazz. <laughs> oh uh, man! And so we're very inclusive here, and and we've decided that we would allow uh, a jazz pianist in wow. to step foot into our studio. Uh, no, but seriously, come on. It's the 21st century. Uh, all styles, in a way, are historical and present all at the same time. We all have YouTube, and we can all learn from each other. And I know I've learned a lot from Jeremy and. We can continue to, and so will you, not just now, but as soon as you purchase one or all of his new books. Jeremy, can you just tell quickly the audience oh, about sure. your book? Oh, sure, if you insist. I insist, <laughs> I insist. So uh, Jazz Piano Fundamentals Book 1 is for people who are just really beginning on their jazz journey, so people who play piano but don't play any jazz yet. And this is the new one. This is Jazz Piano Fundamentals Book 2, which is, as you could probably guess, a co continuation of book one, which is for people who have maybe been studying jazz piano intensely for six months or less intensely for a year, and kind of takes them through the next steps. Um, and then my classic, uh, <laughs> playing solo jazz piano, which is all about the art of uh, playing solo rather than playing with a band. And uh, is this, are you like George Martin? Like, is there a, cont a continuous series of books coming out that you're never going to finish? Or are you really delivering for your fans? <laughs> I like to think those aren't mutually exclusive. Um, I guess they'll have to be the judge. But seriously, he's a pro prolific author, a professor at Fuller Fullerton College, um, just w one of the most, I think, proactive and influential young jazz pianists and teachers of our time. So I am going to get out of the way now and let him take things away and, and tell us on a serious level, us classical musicians... How do we practice jazz? How can we do that? So right. without further ado. <laughs> Thank you, Ben. Hi, everybody. I'm looking over here. OK, perfect. Um, so I'm always really, really grateful to, uh, to be doing anything with Tone Bass. So, so thank you, everybody, for having me. And I want to ask, I want to do my best to answer this question of how does somebody practice jazz? This is a question that I find there's a lot of confusion about both in terms of outsiders to jazz, like classical pianists, but also within like my jazz students. They'll, um, even though I think I'm doing a good job covering what they need to do, they'll come and say, oh, I don't know, know what to do when I get into the practice room. Um, and of course, there's no one single easy answer, but I wanna give you a couple of frameworks um, that I've been developing for myself as well as developing through my books. And, um, I promise this whole thing's not going to be a big sales pitch, but one of the things that I, I think my books do well is that at the end of each unit, there's about eight things listed to do to practice for the two or three weeks that you're working on that unit before you get to the next unit. So um, I take this question really seriously um, because I know that it's a mystery for a lot of folks. So I have kind of this four part plan for what you need to do as a practitioner of jazz. And let me say maybe before, before we delve into this that you have to be able to play your instrument <laughs> before you can get into jazz. I sometimes have people saying, oh, my four-year-old, my five-year-old is really talented. I want to start them with jazz. And I generally say, that's not going to work. Um, you know, you're going to be super limited um, in terms of your creative possibility, your interaction with this style, just based on how well you play the instrument. So um, this practice plan, you know, kind of takes it as a given that you can already play your instrument. I, I assume for most of you it's the piano, but maybe we have some other folks attending as well. Um, if you want to show my iPad now, I've got this little four-part um, graph shown. And so let's think about this in terms of language learning. One thing that we might do as we're learning a language, and I'm actually working on learning Spanish right now. I've got a 304-day Duolingo streak going on, not to brag. Um, is that we might just learn some set phrases, right? Hola, que tal? You want to be able to just say that without thinking. Uh, Donde esta la biblioteca, right? All these just little phrases that you want to be able to toss off because you want to become a native speaker and you want to have these things just like really deep in your subconscious. And I'm a big believer, both in terms of language and musically, that not only do you want to just be able to say that, but you can then use it as a guide to create other phrases, right? If I can say, donde esta la biblioteca, maybe I can say, say, donde esta la casa, or donde esta la mer, right? And I can ask all these different questions by subbing out a word. So one of the things that we wanna do is just learn some, what we call in, in jazz, licks. Um, and we don't wanna stop there, we don't wanna just be somebody who's reciting 
you know, the same sentences over and over. That wouldn't make for a good conversational part partner. But we want to have these things done. So the first part of my practice uh, is what I call rote or transposition exercises. And for pianists especially, there's kind of two main parts. One would be um, transposing licks, so standard jazz phrases. And the other half would be working on voicings, right? How do we play a D minor 7 when we see it on a chart? How do we play an A7 if we see it on the chart? Now, of course, I don't have time. Uh, now is not the time to get into all those specifics and actually answer those questions. I do have a great course on tone base if you want to, you know, kind of pursue some of the uh, some of the beginning answers to those questions. And of course, there's stuff in my books as well. But let me just give you an example of what we would do. Um, so here's the first lick that I ever learned. And in jazz, what we generally do is we're going to come up with licks for common chord progressions. Because, of course, when we learn something, we want it to be useful. We, we learn to say hola que tal because that's something that we're going to say when we meet people, right? Um, so same way in jazz. And the most common chord progression in jazz is what we call the 2-5-1 progression. So an example of a 2-5-1 would be like D minor 7 to G7 to C major 7. And so the first lick I ever learned was for this 2-5-1 progression. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to play... play this lick. And that's, like I said, it's the first lick I ever learned. It's not necessarily the first one that I teach myself, but it's a lovely little phrase. And so during these rote and transposition exercises, I'm going to do a few things. First of all, I'm going to learn this paying close attention to articulation and swing feel, you know, especially if that's a struggle for you, just like I might practice my accent in Spanish, right? Um, don't have time to get into all the details, but I'm going to especially focus on accenting the off beats rather than the notes on the beat. I might practice coordinating it with some rhythms in the left hand. You know, like I often teach my students what's called the Charleston pattern. So I might play. Right, this is what we call the Charleston rhythm. So once I have it coordinated with a couple rhythms, then I'm going to start transposing it. And you can pick your favorite transposition technique. You can transpose it by half steps. You know, I can go up. And those of us who have played jazz for a long time are pretty good, pretty fast at transposition. So um, at the beginning, you might have to write these things out to figure out your fingering, for instance, in different keys, to figure out whether you're using an A flat or an A natural in different keys. But here, we're just getting some basic kind of jazz phrase under our fingers. Et cetera, et cetera. Now I said, on one hand, there's licks, and on the other hand, there's voicings, OK? Um, and we also want to practice voicings within these common chord progressions. So again, starting and essentially with the 2-5-1. Um, I'll show you, you know, one type of voicing. This is a one-handed three-note type A-B voicing for D minor. And what I would do is I would go through and practice taking this voicing type within a 2-5-1. And I would go through all my keys. Because what we want to do, just like that Spanish phrase, is we want to get so fast, so automatic, that when we're playing a tune, it's not even an issue to find that voicing for the 2-5-1. We've got it in our muscle memory. Um, now, some people ask me, is it good to have muscle memory? Don't we want to be conscious of what we're doing? And my reply is that some amount of muscle memory is good. We don't want to have to be reinventing the wheel every time we see a G minor 7. Right? We don't want to have to be like, really struggling to figure out what we're going to play when we see um, a 2 5 one in D major. So I think muscle memory is good. Um, we do want to be conscious of, OK, what chord am I actually playing? And where am I going to apply that? And that'll come in more later. So before we leave part one, let's talk a little bit about where do you find a lick? Where do you learn these voicings from? Um, <laughs> the obvious answer is my books, <laughs> which is jeremysiskin.com. Um, and so I'm partially serious and partially kidding. Um, I think in your first year, 
two years of study as you you know maybe are are pursuing jazz you are gonna have to have somebody spoon feed you some of this stuff that's just the reality of it but ultimately and we're gonna look at this during the second half of this video what we want to be doing is grabbing them not from a book that i or anybody else wrote but actually pursuing grabbing these elements from the recorded history of the music, listening to a recording and saying, I love that lick. I want to learn that lick. Or, ooh, listen to that voicing that Bill Evans is playing as he harmonizes his melody. I want to figure out what that is. And go in and take the nuts and bolts apart and kind of figure it out and then apply it to every key. And this is part of what we mean by finding an artistic voice, is that you're not merely you know, copying what, exactly what somebody else has done. Um, you're not merely taking directions, but you're choosing. You're saying, ooh, I love that moment from that piece by Bill Evans or Oscar Peterson or George Shearing or Keith Jarrett or whoever it might be. Let me try to replicate that and stick around if that's interesting to you. We're gonna be talking about that in the second half. So that's rote and transposition exercises. I'd say mainly licks and voicings. Another element that, um, that you might deal with in uh, number one is what we call scale patterns. And so scale patterns would be something like trying to divide the D major scale into triads. Right? And we want to do this a lot if we're going to be a jazz improviser because, you know, it's very good to know our D major scale. But that's going to be limiting in terms of improvising. If we're just playing the D major scale up and down, then when we're improvising, we're going to be limited to playing it up and down. So what do we do? We start dividing it into different ways. We played, like I said, triads or seventh chords. Or even stacks of fourths. Um, and in my second edition of Jazz Piano Fundamentals in the second book, I talk about even adding in some non-chord tones, some neighbor tones to a scale pattern. So you don't only go but you add a little half step into the top note. Which makes it immediately more kind of jazz appropriate. So that could be a third element as you get more advanced that you work on in those rote and transposition exercises. Okay, so that's number one here. Number two is controlled improvisation activities. And what I mean here is that we're not going through and trying to play an entire tune and trying to make a brilliant solo or trying to comp, trying, trying to, you know, find voicings and accompaniment patterns for an entire tune. But instead, what we're going to do is we're going to place some kind of a little limit. And we're going to take just a short progression or even just one chord and explore using that limit. And as you get more advanced, you're going to want to, of course, change what sorts of controlled activities you're doing. So here's an example of a controlled improvisation activity for a beginner, somebody who really doesn't play jazz. Um, and I believe I talk about this in our tone base, um, in our tone base course. So we could do what's called a drone improvisation, in which I might just hold a nice low fifth in my left hand. This can be as new agey as you want. I'm going to use some pedal here. And I'm going to maybe set a timer and just improvise melodies that I like. Okay, so that's a great place to start, but then we want to do something similar. We can continue with the drone, but place some points of focus or even some restrictions on what we're doing. So here's, here's one you might try. I want to, I'm going to play a drone improvisation, but I'm never going to have a step between the two notes, either a half step or a whole step. So everything has to be a leap. This is a great exercise for beginners because a lot of beginners play with a closed hand. So now I'm never going to go from C to D or from C to B, but I'm always going to try to leap. And I'm going to see if I can do that for one or two minutes. It's tricky. You really have to think. Oh, there was a step. I failed. <laughs> okay, so that's a good challenge. It's going to get you out of your box. Or how about this? Um, do a drone improvisation, but focus on using grace notes. 
In jazz, we often use grace notes just a half step below to simulate a pitch bend. So I'm gonna do that same drone in C. And now I'm gonna focus on adding a lot of grace notes. Okay. So we could start with a drone improvisation, like that. As you get more advanced, you know, towards kind of the early intermediate or intermediate level, you're gonna be wanting to do some two, five, one practice, right? I've already mentioned the two, five, one a number of times. It's gonna keep coming up because it's our most common chord progression in jazz. And so what you can do is you can um, either have a backing track or you can play the roots of the two, five, one in your left hand. And this you wanna do in rhythm with the metronome so that you can make sure that you're executing it in time. Um, I often say that practicing without a metronome is like playing tennis without the net. Um, you know, <laughs> without the net, you're just gonna hit great shot after great shot, and you're gonna say, I'm the greatest tennis player in the world. And without the metronome, I see some of my students doing this, saying like, I'm really succeeding, but then not really actually being able to execute things as quickly as they need to. So um, let's see, what sorts of exercises could we do over a 251? We could think about phrasing. So one exercise that I like doing with my students is what I call play one, rest one, where we're gonna play for the first bar and the third bar of the two, five, one, and then rest for the second and the fourth bar. So we play two, three, four, rest, two, three, play two, three, four, rest, two, three, four. Okay, so this, this is it. You're improvising, but it's a controlled activity, right? You're practicing it kind of in a specific way. So that might sound like this, play, Rest, play, rest, play, rest, play, rest. Now with these activities, notice that it's not something that where you have like an end goal point, right? With a lot of classical practicing, and I think this is a big difference between jazz practice and classical practice. With a lot of classical practice, it's piece-based, right? You practice until you can play the piece elegantly, uh, with good fingering, following all the dynamics, hopefully with some kind of interpretation at a higher level, at the tempo that you want. And then you say, you know, you perform and you say, okay, I'm done with that piece. I'm gonna choose an, a new piece or I'm gonna wait for my teacher to assign a new piece. Um, with jazz, it actually doesn't really work that way. In jazz, the pieces aren't really the challenge. You can hear, you know, the most basic beginner jazz pianists play Autumn Leaves, and then you can go and you can hear Keith Jarrett play Autumn Leaves. Same exact piece. The difference is gonna be in the interpretation and what they do with it. So with these improv activities, what we're not doing is looking for any particular end goal. What we wanna do is form habits, okay? Um, here, it's the habit of playing and resting in these kind of symmetrical call and response style phrases, as well as just simply playing clear phrases with a beginning and an ending which some beginning improvisers don't do. So what I recommend is, is putting on a timer, um, five minutes, 10 minutes, and saying, okay, I'm gonna do it for this long. And even though you might think that's boring, I'm doing the same thing for 10, five or 10 minutes, what I actually love is it forces you to be creative within the parameters, which is a lot of what jazz is about, right? Jazz gives you chord symbols, and then you have to be really creative within those parameters. Here's another example of a controlled exercise that we might do in that second part of practice. We might improvise, but only allow ourselves to use the one, three, five, seven of each chord, what we might think of as kind of arpeggio improvisation. And when I say arpeggio, I don't mean, you know, playing your warm-up arpeggios. I mean, just moving from only chord tone to chord tone. And this is a great exercise because all those notes are, are safe notes. They're gonna be ones that you can leap towards and you're not gonna have any kind of a dissonance. So I could do that same thing, and I'm only gonna play D, F, A, C on the D minor, G, B, F, G, B, D, F on the G7, and C, E, G, B. But now I can play them in any rhythm, any octave. Let's see what that sounds like. So one, two, three, four.
maybe it's not the most colorful thing that you've ever improvised, but this is giving you a parameter to practice. It's giving you a particular goal that you're aiming for. And let's pause and talk about goals for just a second, because that's another part where I think people get caught up and confused about practicing jazz, right? Again, with classical music, you do have this goal of being able to play this piece. And so with these improvisation activities, you need to know what your goal is. You need to have that parameter really clear so that you can evaluate, did I do well or did I not do well? And notice that my goal is not, I sounded great. <laughs> my goal is not, I played the most killing solo over that 251, man, I crushed it. The goal is, you know, I set this, these parameters for myself of only playing the 1357 and staying in rhythm, and then I achieve that. And then I can loosen my, my parameters, and I'll have had this experience, which is training me to improvise in a different way. I think I say in, in our tone-based course that one of the principles for learning jazz that I believe in is that learning jazz is about learning a bunch of rules and then breaking them, or learning how to break them. If you're not learning rules, you're not really learning anything. You're not going to have a clear sense of what you're achieving. Um, but if you're really sticking to rules, then you're not going to be a very interesting improviser and you're not going to be playing with any kind of a sense of creative freedom. So the rules are an essential part of learning, but you also need to be smart about when to abandon them. I'll give you one more example of a controlled improvisation activity. Let's do this. I'm going to play consistent eighth notes without stopping. They could be any notes that I choose, except, and this is an important except, I'm always going to hit the third of the chord right on the downbeat. And this is a really important one because we so often in jazz aim for that third of the chord. Okay, So this is difficult because I need to kind of prepare to hit that third, but I'm going to play nonstop eighth notes. Let's see if I can do it. One, two, ready, and... tell I've done that before. I definitely practice those controlled improvisation activities because they're the best thing to prepare me to eventually actually play repertoire. Which brings me to point number three, <laughs> which is actually playing tunes. Um, of course, our jazz practice session would be very incomplete if we weren't actually trying to play repertoire and enjoying and challenging ourselves to play the jazz tunes that we love. So part three of a good jazz practice session, in my opinion, is working on tunes. And I'm generally a fan of having two contrasting tunes in your repertoire, in your practice at all times. Um, what do we want to do when we learn tunes? First thing is that we want to just simply learn them. So you want to figure out how to play the melody. And when we play a melody in jazz, we don't just play the melody, but we always personalize the melody. We always present a loose, version of the melody that feels a little bit more spoken than how it's presented. We want to find voicings that are appropriate. And one of the tricky things about playing jazz piano is there's so many different ways that we might be called on to play a tune, right? We might be called on to play it in a larger ensemble where we just have to play the chords with no bass and no melody. We might be called upon to play it as a tr in a piano trio where you have to play the melody and then play chords with the left hand. You might be called upon to play it with a vocalist in a duo setting where you have to play the bass in the left hand and the chords in the right. So, you know, it might seem like a quick and easy thing to do to figure out voicings for a tune, um, but in fact, you might need to figure out a whole bunch of different kinds of voicings. And then you want to practice those voicings until uh, you, find, you feel really confident and comfortable to be able to uh, execute them. You want to listen to the tune that you're playing and figure out, uh, you know, different kind of take to heart different versions and be prepared if somebody says, I want to play that, I want to play Have You Met Miss Jones in the style of the Oscar Peterson trio, have an idea of what that means. How do people start the tune? What kind of introductions are there? What kind of endings are there, right? What are the lyrics to the tune? Can you find a vocal recording that has the lyrics so that you have a sense of what the tune is about? And then, of course, you want to practice improvising on your tune. And sometimes, of course, when we're improvising, we just want to go for it, right? <laughs> you want to put no parameters. You want to have fun. You want to explore 
You want to just see where you're at. Um, but sometimes what we want to do is apply number one and number two, the rote exercises and the controlled improv activities to our tunes as well. What do I mean? So for example, if we're learning a particular 251 lick, we might then go and practice inserting that 251 lick into our tunes, right? Because just like if I'm learning a new word in Spanish, I'm going to try to put it into a sentence or I'm going to try to work it into a conversation. So if I've learned this lick that I presented at the beginning of, of the presentation, if I'm playing a tune like Afternoon in Paris, I could play hear that lick in there? I think I put it in three or maybe even four times. And I'm trying to kind of camouflage it in. Just like if I learn a new word, I don't want to really point it out. I want to make it match the conversation. So you want to practice putting those dry elements that you practice. If you practice this scale pattern, that I presented at the beginning of the presentation, maybe you want to practice putting that somewhere in your tune. these elements that you've been preparing. That's the whole point of preparing them is so that you can actually use them, right? And then you want to also do the same things that you're doing in your controlled improvisation activities. Maybe if you're practicing using grace notes in a drone exercise, then you want to go ahead and use those same grace notes as you're playing a tune. So if I play that same tune, <laughs> try to use a ton of grace notes to be really expressive as I improvise. Or if I'm trying to do play one, rest one phrasing, I'll do that same thing on a tune. So one, two, three, four, rest, 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 rest. Okay, so everything that I'm practicing in number one and number two, I want to Force maybe isn't the, the kindest word, but I want to uh, bridge my practicing from those more controlled activities into actual improvisation. So that's practicing tunes. Um, and ideally, you can then go ahead and play those tunes with others. And I'll tell you, you know, back to that language metaphor, um, I have this two-pronged approach to learning Spanish right now. Um, so. I've got my 304-day streak on Duolingo that I'm very proud of. Um, but then every Monday, I'm getting together with Claudia, who uh, is a tutor um, who lives in El Salvador. And we have an hour-long conversation. And if I was just doing the Duolingo, I think I'd, my reading would get pretty good. My pronunciation's getting better. But actually coming up with sentences, making them grammatically correct, fishing words out of my subconscious, that's really difficult. So having these conversations with Claudia, and honestly, I could probably use more than an hour a week, that trains that other side of the brain. And so I'd really, really recommend, if you are very passionate about jazz, it is an art form best learned with the company of others. Which brings us to number four, which is interacting with the recorded history of the music. And there's probably a, a, a shorter way to say this. <laughs> um, but I wanted to say it that way because what we want to do is not just listen, although listening is crucial to becoming a better jazz player, um, but we want to be very active listeners. How do we become active listeners? So um, first way is doing really focused, repeated listening. So um, in both of those Jazz Piano Fundamentals books, it's been a while since I've done a plug, guys. In both of these books, uh, each unit has guided listening, where it kind of explains what's happening in a famous uh, jazz performance. And then it, the, in, the unit, um, in the unit directions, it tells you to listen to that track at least 20 times. 
and try to pay attention to different instruments. What is the pianist doing? Does it relate to what the saxophonist is doing? Does it relate to what the bass player is doing? Listen to it while you look at the lead sheet so that you can see oh, what's changing as they get to the middle part, the bridge of the tune. What's changing every time they get to the beginning of the tune? Those things are crucial to understanding uh, what actually happens when you play in a band. Um, we want to listen and sing along with the track. We want to listen and play along with the track. And then maybe at its most intense level, we want to listen and write down some of the things that we're hearing in a track. So, you know, we say that jazz is an oral art form, and we're truly not kidding. <laughs> um, if you're doing jazz without the listening aspect, you're really doing a very incomplete job of learning jazz. And I'm not sure how I'm doing on time, but I want to share a little bit about how we um, might move from listening to actually creating elements for this practice session. And let me just go back and frame that I told you that you know, for your first six months, year, maybe a little bit more, depending how much you're practicing, <laughs> um, I would expect a teacher or a book or a course like Tone Base to kind of tell you what you should be doing at each step, right? To give you a lick to learn. And yes, there are licks for each unit in Jazz Piano Fundamentals. Um, and then what kind of improv activities should you be doing? What should you be practicing? And then which tunes should you be learning? But what we want to do as we get deeper into your jazz experience is do what I call like a self-guided, or sorry, a self-motivated practice session, where you're not getting these elements necessarily from a teacher, but instead you're getting them from the recorded history of the music. So let me show you uh, a little bit of what I mean. Um, before, before I do that, can you guys see the iPad up, up there? I'll just show you what, what the assignments look like in the book. So. Um, the first assignment here is an improvisation exercise, which is improvise using the blues scale. So it's directing you to improvise using a specific scale in four different keys. The second thing is a lick, 2-5-1 lick 2. Um, so we're practicing the lick, practicing transposing it, practicing coordinating it with comping patterns, and then applying it to tunes. Um, and then it has 2-5-1 exercises where you're practicing voicings. Remember we said we might practice voicings as well as improvising. Um, and then you can see the number six has guided listening. So it's telling you to listen to this tune, Pie Eyes Blues, by Duke Ellington at least 20 times. So I think one of the best things about, the, about the, the book series is that it doesn't leave you guessing as to what you should be doing with your practice sessions. OK. So what you should be seeing on your screen now is a transcription that I've done. And this is, um, I actually went and wrote down a solo by saxophonist Hank Mobley. I've probably done about 100 different transcriptions in my life as a professional jazz musician. Um, I think that's relative, like a relatively normal number for, for a professional jazz musician. I often get the question, do I have to transpose it myself? Or there's books where they sell these things. Can I just buy it from a book? And you can just buy it from a book, but you're really missing a big part of the experience, which is, one, just ear training, getting better at hearing what people are playing, and two, getting really deep into this solo. You're never going to get as deep by just playing it as you will by really struggling with it, writing it down, really having to listen to it over and over to say, oh, is that a B flat or a B? And oh, is that an eighth note or is it a triplet? Right? All these things are just really crucially important. So let me play you uh, just this little brief excerpt from this solo by Hank Mobley. Um, I'll play some basic chords in the left hand. One, two, three. Beautiful, beautiful melodies. Just, just, mwah. I love it. Hope you like it too. So then the question always becomes, okay, I like this solo. I've learned to play it. I've transcribed it, but I still don't sound like Hank Mobley when I play. How do you get from, you know, what you see on the screen to actually changing the way that you might improvise? And so I've come up with this little acronym called the Korea process, named after the great jazz pianist Chick Korea. Um, 
just as a tribute to him, I don't have evidence that like he used this process or anything, but it's uh, it's just a useful acronym and, and pays homage to Chick Corea. And I'm g I want to walk you through it just a little bit. Sorry for my little technical staff foos, but we're doing good here. So the C of Korea stands for choose. Okay, we're gonna choose a phrase that we love. We're gonna um, we're gonna figure out. Okay, here's a little bit of that solo that I really want to master and imitate. And then we're going to practice imitating that phrase over a set progression. Okay, so it's just like part two of your practice session. You're going to play just a two five one or just a drone, and you're going to imitate something about that phrase. Then you're going to play a tune, and you're going to use it repeatedly. Okay, so whatever it was that you liked about the phrase, and we'll talk about it, maybe it was the rhythm, maybe it was the harmonic content. Every time you can apply it to a tune, you're gonna just repeat it relentlessly. Then the E stands for elegantly. Okay, so, you know, if you're repeating the same rhythm again and again, obviously that's not going to, um, make for a good solo, so you want to be able to use it in context so that you can actually use this concept elegantly. Um, so you're going to scale back and only use the concept once every eight measures, once every 16 measures, so that it actually fits into the overall arc of the improvisation. And then the most fun part to me is you're going to ask what if questions. So you're not going to simply stop at whatever you learn from that Hank Mobley little chunk but you're gonna ask yourself, oh, that's cool. What if I tried it this way? Or Ooh, what if I loosened that rule a little bit and I went, let's say, down instead of up? So let me show you how this works. Um, and certainly, if you are interested in this, there's kind of a lot more information, a lot more examples um, in this book. Um, so I think of at least four different kinds of things that I could grab. One is rhythmic, okay? I could say that I love a certain rhythm. A second one is harmonic, right? Harmony has to do with, uh, in jazz, harmony has to do with which notes we choose against what kind of chords, right? Do I like using the ninth against a minor chord? Do I like using the flat 13th against a dominant chord? Um, or do I like the way that the flat nine and flat 13 sound with one another, right? Any of those sorts of things where we're thinking about what kind, which chord tone are we using against a certain kind of chord? But then I also think of gestures. Shape is very important in jazz. Where do we go up? Where do we go down? Where do we use a certain kind of rhythm? So we might grab something that's a gestural concept, and then I'll imitate that. Or we might grab something that's a connective concept. And this is kind of cool. You know, of course, in jazz, we want to tell a story with our solo. So we want what's happening in one phrase to strongly relate to what's happening in, in the next phrase, or maybe two phrases from that. And so we might analyze the solo, and we might look and see, how does phrase A relate to phrase B? How does phrase B relate to phrase C? Is that something that I could steal and do something similar in my own solos? So I don't know that we have time to go over each of these concepts, but I want to show you just you know briefly how does this work. And if you're interested, again, you can check out Jazz Piano Fundamentals book two. Let's, let's zoom in here. Um, and let's take a look at this phrase here. So this is kind of interesting because it's actually pretty much just a harmonic minor scale, a D harmonic minor scale going down. But Hank Mobley doesn't just play a scale going down. That would be a boring shape. He puts in these little neighbor tones, or we, it even kind of seems like a little mordant, right? That, that interrupts um, what we're doing. It interrupts the single motion of the scale. So that would be an example of a gestural concept, and I kind of like that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to practice using a similar concept. So let's say if we go back to our, our Korea, ugh, sorry, if we go back to our, our Korea process, I've chosen now a concept. And so my concept's gonna be to play a downward scale interrupted by these little mordants, by these little turns. So let me practice using it over 
a repeated progression. So I'm just gonna practice a two, five, one progression. We've been doing C all day, so D minor to G7 to C major. And just like my practice session, I would practice uh, this in a timed way. I put on a, a timer for five or 10 minutes. Don't worry, I'm not gonna make you watch me do this for five or 10 minutes. And I would practice with different rhythms, starting on different notes. What's it like to just play a scale going down interrupted by these little turns? So. experimenting different rhythms, stopping in different places, trying to figure out, oh, how does this work? Can I make it work? And maybe I could even try with a slightly different scale. We could raise the sixth and we could say. You know, we could kind of create these different sounds. So after I feel like I have a really good mastery of that, maybe practice that over a few days in a few different keys. Then I'm gonna go to a tune, and let's take uh, let's take Autumn Leaves, well-known jazz tune, and I'm just gonna only use this. It's gonna be the most boring solo, the most repetitive solo ever, because I'm focusing. I'm trying to overdo it, so that then I'm creating a habit for myself. And again, I'd probably put on a timer for about 10 minutes as I'm practicing this, and I'm gonna practice the same concept. Now, um, you might not know which scales you're gonna play on Autumn Leaves, and this is why this is kind of more for an intermediate student to do. Um, but here we are on Autumn Leaves. two bars one what we call a chorus in jazz of autumn leaves using that phrase repeatedly and if I was really intent on being a good practitioner I might do this over two or three different tunes to really try to master this concept not just master it to make it a, a habit of something that my hand knows how to do my brain my ear kind of all recognize and then I would scale back and I would try to use it elegantly can I use it in context so that it sounds good just like Hank Mobley does okay so let's see in there. Use it again there. So did you guys hear? I'd used it maybe three times total within those 16 measures. And now it's actually fitting in. It's becoming part of my vocabulary. Just like Don de Estala Biblioteca, you know, might become part of my Spanish vocabulary. And then the last part, um, and this is the last thing I'll say before I open it up for some questions, um, is that we want to take this idea and not just use those that scale down with mordants, but ask some what if questions. So, you know, could we do something similar if we were ascending in a scale? <laughs> That's kind of interesting. So Hank Mobley didn't ascend, but we could try ascending. Or what if we're leaping around more so than just moving down a scale stepwise? But we're still using that little idea of that mordant, right? So I'm leaping. Or what if instead of just one note interrupting, what if it was two notes that were going back in the scale two notes? Interesting. That gives it a really different inflection. Or what if we always chose half steps instead of using notes in the scale? That 
that's kind of interesting too, right? So um, that's my favorite part is asking those what if questions and finding, oh, I like what Hank Mobley did, but maybe I could make it a little bit more my own. Maybe I could make it a little bit more Jeremy um, than just exactly imitating what Hank Mobley did. So that's a really brief overview of this Korea process, which, you know, helps you to create a self-generating practice session because you're grabbing things from the record history of the music that you love and then you're practicing incorporating them into your own musicianship into your own musical vocabulary into your own musical personality so ben are we ready with some questions do you, you want to give about a minute of just some nice music while i myself <laughs> sure over? i'll keep playing on them there we go speak for the classical pianists who are who are watching this i think most of you who are reviewing this are classical pianists this is our cam right mircha i can see you say hi jeremy say hi um so i have some fun questions from you know from the, okay. uh, from the viewers i think it clearly betrays their classical training great so if you're down um let, let's take a couple and Bring it i've on. got some ideas myself but thank you so much first of all for this presentation yeah. you managed to put together both useful but also concise um, materials, um, both in your books and in your videos. I guess not so concise, but yeah, comprehensive. Right. <laughs> well, you can do both. It can be comprehensive, it can be uh, useful and, and in a live stream. So just thanks for sharing your talents with us. My pleasure. Grace asks, she says, all the jazz was brainwashed out of me since I was four. <laughs> uh -huh. This is what happens to us. Besides major and minor chords, mm -hmm. where do you even start learning to identify chords and even transposing? Grace, first of all, Jeremy Siskin's Intro to Jazz Course on Tone Bass. Hey, hey. This is the place to go. But if you want to give a, just a quick answer to that to a, any classical musician who just like sits there and all we know is major and minor, we, we hardly want to add the seventh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wow. Where to start? There's, there's so much to say. Um, so, you know, I guess my first piece of advice, and, and maybe this is the wrong place to start, but would be to just familiarize yourself looking at a lead sheet. So that you even kind of start knowing the right questions to ask. So I think you probably know the word lead sheet, but just in case, a lead sheet is um, a kind of how we generally read small group jazz music, which is just a melody line and then chord symbols. And so if you start looking at a lead sheet, um, then you can start kind of seeing the different sorts of symbols that we might encounter in jazz. Um, so we certainly use almost exclusively chords that have at least a seventh. So minor sevenths, major sevenths, dominant sevenths, some diminished sevenths, which I bet you're familiar with if you're a classical musician. Um, and then we also use some half diminished chords. But honestly, in my opinion, the palette of chords is not that great. It's really how we interpret the yeah. chords, right? It's building up using what we call upper extensions, which, you know, instead of stopping the scale at the eighth note, we keep going and we form C major chords with ninths with we usually leave out the eleventh doesn't sound very nice but with thirteenths and sometimes with the sharp eleven so we use a lot of upper extensions and then for dominant chords we use a lot of alterations which means changing one or two notes of a dominant chord to make it more spicy more colorful so instead of just having this pretty little G G nine we might have a G flat nine sharp five which if I voice it out more nicely, it sounds really pretty and really kind of jazz appropriate. So those are kind of the two areas that to me really separate classical and jazz harmony is that we have the upper extensions we build not only to the seventh, but above and above and above. And then we often choose to use alterations on dominant chords. I'm gonna adjust the mic because I saw a YouTube comment that said that I'm, uh, he said, bro, Ben, bro, you're not so mic, <laughs> so I'm gonna scoot oh. in. How's that? <laughs> But um, I'm just watching you do this effortlessly, and I'm wondering from my naive classical brain, are there any voicing exercises that might be useful for those of us just getting started? I mean, I know you've, you've discussed a couple in your, in your course you do, but 
you know, voicing to a pianist, classical pianist, means actually giving more weight to this or that chord. Right. Of course, when we talk about theory, voicing does mean what it means in jazz. But I think the most intimidating for, thing for me when I sit down is, okay, I, I kind of grasp jazz harmony on a really basic level. I just don't know how to spread it out across the piano. Mm. So what, what are some basic just, you know, ways to distribute these, these harmonies across the keyboard? Yeah, so voicing is this enormous, big, big subject <laughs> yeah. in jazz. You know, um, with my third, fourth year, students were still learning new, different kinds of jazz voicings. But if I had to, you know, give you the quickest, dirtiest explanation of, <laughs> of jazz voicings, um, the biggest things I would suggest are that um, we call the third and seventh of each chord the essential tones. These are the tones that give the chord its color, its sound, its sonority. We can tell whether chords major, minor, dominant using the third and seventh. And so we usually put those just to the left of the letters of the piano. So for example, for a D minor chord, here's the third and the seventh, the F and the C. Right, I've got the root all the way down there, I've got the F and the C there. And then once we have that kind of structure in place, we can put as many color tones as we want within limits, um, on top of that. So for instance, from here, I could put the ninth and the fifth on top of it and get a really beautifully spread chord. And I know I'm reaching that tenth, I don't have to, I could put it there I was gonna well. ask, somebody mentioned um, your nice span there with the tenth. Yeah, or I could put the third, the, so there's my, there's my, we call this a shell, when we have just the root, the third and the seventh. Or we could put the ninth, fifth, thirteenth, I'll double the root and the eleventh above it, right? So I'm, now I'm going all in with these upper extensions. Can I ask you something about your brain when you just did that? Sure. And you just knew that the thirteenth was there, uh, you know, a whole I'm a step away. I'm a semi-professional, Ben. I can tell you're professional. <laughs> that's why I want to get inside this professional's brain. Is is could you like introspect on what actually was happening when you were just sort of instinctively knowing? Okay, we're all right here. The thirteenth is next. Obviously, it's right here within this texture. Where do you think that? What's happening mentally? Like what? layers of, of experience do you think allow you to do that effortlessly? Well, that actually kind of ties into the second rule I was going to give you. So if the first one is that we want to kind of keep the essential tones in this mm -hmm. privileged spot down here, the second rule would be that we want to avoid doublings. Mm -hmm. So if I, you know, have all these notes down here, I can kind of in my brain think, okay, which notes are missing from that shape that I might still include in this D minor chord? So I'm kind of like checking mentally off in my brain. How like, much of it's a ear, how much of it's finger, you know, when you're like, uh, oh, what's missing? It's hard, it's hard yeah, to separate, just, honestly. They, they feel the same. Yeah, yeah. it's very instinctive mm -hmm. by this point, just because I've been doing it so mm -hmm. long. So, you know, I kind of, it's, it's almost like this little puzzle of, oh, here, I'm pretty sure I'm using every single note of C major, which is the same as D Dorian, which mm -hmm. we use for D minor. But I know that I've put my essential notes down here, and then I'm just finding convenient positions for the color tones up there. Um, so that's, um, did I mention that the second rule is avoiding doublings, right. is not playing the third and seventh again, or the, you know, we don't generally play the root again, because we're just not adding color, and we're actually kind of shutting down some of the sonorousness, some of the ring of the chord when we double those notes. So those would be kind of rules A and B to keep in mind, um, and if you can really execute on those, you can find a lot of pretty good jazz voicings. Very cool. Okay, so let's change the tune a bit. I hope I'm, I'm more or less audible. Um, in going through all keys, Mark uh, on the tone bass platform asks, um, how do minor keys or modes fit into the practice routine? That's such a good question. Um, and it's a great one to tie into my book promo. Because uh, book one, <laughs> ta-da, jeremysiskin.com. You know this, this will be my job. Okay. You, you talk. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Book one is all about major keys, um, which are much simpler in every way than minor keys. Book two, the first six chapters, are all about dealing with minor keys. So I actually, uh, in my classes, in my lessons, I actually don't really introduce minor keys until students are pretty well set up in major keys. So I, I teach a two-semester jazz class at, at Fullerton College. First semester, we don't deal with anything happening in minor keys. Second semester, we do delve into them. So um, I guess my short answer, um, Mark, is that I avoid minor keys with my more beginning students. Um, and then after about six months of practice, six months of really getting used to some of the tenets of improvisation and matching chords and scales and rhythms and all that, then we get into the difficult theories of minor keys. And 
I'll give you just the brief yeah, reason please. of why, why minor keys are, are difficult. Um, so even in classical music, we talk about different minor scales. Mm -hmm. We talk about scales that are used for the harmony versus scales that are used for the melody, right? Harmonic minor and melodic minor. And then even within melodic minor, in classical theory at least, we talk about it going being different, going up. Personally, I think that's going, bogus. <laughs> ba okay. Bach didn't follow that rule. So, But it, yes, we are taught that when we're playing them up and down. For yeah. Sure. And then we run into all these problems because we're often trying to um, avoid the interval of the minor ninth. Because even as jazz pianists, this <laughs> interval like is generally too dissonant to include. I'm sure you could find a way to make it. Cool. Yeah, well, so Thelonious Monk <laughs> does it all the time, which is one of the reasons that he sounds like Thelonious Monk, uh, which is often kind of a little bit grating, you can know, you, purposeful. Can, is there any way you could give us a? Yeah, little... sure. So whereas I might play a D dominant flat nine like this with a lovely Ooh, spacing velvety. between the chords, Monk might play that highlighting the dissonance of that minor ninth interval, right? And so we're using essentially the same notes, but he's voicing it. There's that word again, right? In a way where he's highlighting the minor ninth interval. And he'll do the same thing with tritones, for instance. You know, whereas if I'm using a half diminished chord, which comes up a lot in minor keys, and I want to play D half diminished like that, he might, you know, really privilege that tritone interval and make sure that everybody can hear it. <laughs> Whereas we're trying to generally soften it if we're trying to make quote unquote, you know, prettier sounds. So that minor ninth interval comes up all the time in all kinds of different places in minor keys. Whereas in major keys, it's pretty limited where it comes about. So, you know, the two chord in a minor key is a half diminished chord, right? Um, Cause if we use the harmonic minor scale, I think I'm losing half the audience now. Are the numbers just plummeting? <laughs> no, they're actually increasing. I'm wow. Sure. This is, well, they'll this be is plummeting soon. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, if we're selecting notes from that half diminished, from the harmonic minor scale to make a two chord, we get a half diminished chord, right? But if we build it up to the ninth, we get this minor ninth interval, which people don't generally like in their chord. So we have to come up with different options. So some people, even though that this is the third of our key, some people say, well, this is prettier. <laughs> Let's make it, you know, momentarily major. Or some people say, well, we should never play the ninth on a half diminished chord. We should just replace it with the root instead. The ninth is, is bogus. Um, other people, Dizzy Gillespie famously said, there's no such thing as a half diminished chord. He said, D half diminished is actually F minor six in inversion. And so some people say, well, when I play a D half diminished, I'm just gonna think about F minor six. So there's like still no settled like theory in jazz about what the correct thing to do. That's good to know because I because there's disputes between jazz and classical theory about like is is that a root position chord or a first inversion chord? Could jazz, be either. Classical theory doesn't have the add six, so we we mm -hmm. would see that as a first inversion a half diminished chord. But even jazz. Jazz guys are, you know... We're still uh, confused so about minor confused key. About so it. I'm trying to be as clear as I can in, in, in the book about laying out some of the different options that you have. Like, the good news is you've got all these different kinds of colors mm -hmm. to play with, right? right? And Bill Evans is going to do it very differently than Hank Jones and Thelonious Monk and all, you know, it's part of what somebody does, you know, stylistically is how they treat these things. But I think it's fascinating that just, just one moving of the position of an mm -hmm. interval to the right will suddenly make you sound more like Th Thelonious Monk instead of, you know, Jeremy Sisson. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or whoever. But but I, I guess that's part of the training when you transcribe. You realize, oh, it's the voice. He does it here, not there. Totally. You probably have these eureka moments. Like, this is what makes his style, like, distinctive, right? Absolutely. And, you know, hopefully I didn't present it this way, but I know sometimes people look at transcribing as this, like, chore of, like, oh, I have to sit and write this thing down. And to me, it's like the ultimate act of curiosity <laughs> of listening to something that you love and just being like, what makes this thing tick? I wanna know why Chick Corea sounds the way that he does or why Keith Jarrett sounds the way that he does. So like, as I'm transcribing, I'm not like, oh boy, here we go again. I gotta <laughs> do my work. I'm like, Ooh, what's coming next? Like, what's that next note? And what's but, the scale that he's using? How does it all fit together? It's right? only we classical pianists who hate practicing. You know, <laughs> but, no, but I, what's fascinating is that you're giving us a window into inside what jazz players actually do when you're practicing because it seems to us from the outside that you guys just already know how to play everything it's just flowing out of you uh, you know you're improvising it so how did you practice that but right. clearly there's frameworks here and this leads me to a question that you get every time so okay. i'm going to reframe it because it, 
I'm, you I'm know ready. it's you know it's a classical audience when they ask you about Capustin. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but I I want to distinguish between jazz and jazzy. Mm-hmm. There's a big difference. Uh, so Alice, the, um, Capustin is jazzy. Uh, he he draws on jazz idioms in composed notated music so that we classical players can pretend like we actually know something <laughs> about jazz. Uh, but maybe you could comment on on that difference between learning notated music and the skills one might pick up from playing something that's jazzy from the very different process of actually being able to extemporize in, in jazz forms, even at a simple level. Can, does one even remotely translate into the other? Yeah, that's an interesting question. And um, certainly, I think it's worth saying that my understanding, and I'm not by any means the world's leading expert, is that Kabustin actually could play jazz, sure. that, that he yeah. actually was a, a pretty decent yeah. jazz player, if, if not very good. Um, I've never heard him play. Um, but um, yeah, to me, they're, they're uh, so, OK, here's an interesting perspective, maybe. The um, people talk about ragtime versus stride piano. Um, and what's the difference? Where, where does one end and the other begins? And the historians, or at least many historians, my, my understanding is, say that stylistically, there's no difference between ragtime and early stride. The difference is the process. Whereas ragtime is this fully notated music, mm -hmm. stride piano is unnotated and largely created by the artist or improvised. It's a really good example. Um, and so the process does matter. Here's another story that, that my teacher, Tony Caramia at Eastman, was, was fond of, of uh, citing that, that um, Art Tatum, the great, the great jazz virtuoso, walked into a bar and um, somebody was playing an Art Tatum transcription, right? Someone mm -hmm. had written down everything from Art Tatum, which is no small mm -hmm. task, and was performing it, which, I mean, Tatum like, was one of the technical monsters of our generation. Sure. Um, and bravo to anybody playing an Art Tatum transcription. And so somebody turned to Art Tatum and was like, hey, he's playing your transcription. You know, he's playing your thing. He's, he sounds like you. And Art Tatum looked back at him and he said, he doesn't know why I played it. Mm -hmm. Which to me is so fascinating. And the reason that I love being the creator is, you know, there's one thing of being the interpreter, and that is a noble art form. I certainly don't look down on it, and I've done, I've been it many times. Um, but there's something about being the creator and the performer at the same time that allows you this maximal amount of self-expression, right? Um, and especially as pianists, we have this incredible privilege that we can be the entire band. So not only can we be creative in the moment, but we don't need to rely on anybody else to be there to do it. We can take the music in any direction that we want. And I think, you know, Keith Jarrett's solo concerts where he just sits down and improvises the whole concert <laughs> is probably the greatest example of like this just immediate creativity flowing through somebody in the most the, personal way. The Sun Bear concerts. Sun Bear concerts are, are beautiful. Phenomenal. Um, and I know some classical pianists actually who've been very inspired by them in, in just learning how to color the, the, know, the pianism the is, is, is oh, it's, wild. It's, so <laughs> yeah. this, this is a good segue because, yes, we can be the whole band at the piano, but sometimes we like playing with a band. Mm -hmm. And a user named I Am Practicing Piano. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Love it. First of all, I mean, good for you. Good, good work ethic. Um, Although they are watching YouTube videos, That's too. right. <laughs> well, I mean, maybe he's multitasking, okay, you know, right. like in this day and age. <laughs> uh, he says, I would love to hear Jeremy's insight into how jazz piano arrangements change when you have a bass player with you and when you do not. My bass player tries to convince me to only play right hand. Okay, well, you know, you might need new friends. Uh, <laughs> so, but your, your friend might be right. So I like to think of basically three elements that we need in jazz at, not quite at all times, but most of the time. One is the bass, right? And we have kind of these standard jazz bass lines. The second element is the chords, right? And usually, if we're the pianist in the group, we're, we're in charge of the chords. And we could play these chords either with two hands, you know, I was showing you some voicings for two hands. We call this comping, right? When we make up our, our own accompaniment. Or we can play voicings with one hand. As pianists, we are probably the most flexible instrument in the band, right? We, ca we could play solo, we could play, we could accompany a vocalist, we could do all these different things. Um, so it's kind of up to us to fit into whichever role we're given. Mm -hmm. So if you're playing with a bass player, 
don't play the bass. So if that's what you were doing with the left hand, stop doing it. Your friend is right in that case. <laughs> but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't play your left hand at all. What I would do is I would play the chords with your left hand in a nice voicing in the middle range. And I'd play the melody with your right. Right. Um, so you've got enough to do with two hands. You've got chords, yeah. you've got melody to play, but do leave that bass register alone. That poor bass players, they only have one job. <laughs> they only have one thing that they can do in life. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, you know, do uh, do leave them alone to do that job. You want your bass player to be happy. Oh man, they have all the gigs. They are, they are the <laughs> connector. Um, are you cool to stay another 10 minutes? I'm not doing anything. Let's go for a lightning round, because now, now the questions are pouring in. Okay, great. Uh, so, Sebastian... I'm a um, Libra. No. <laughs> <laughs> when transcribing a solo, should we try to do it away from the piano, or can we use the piano for help? Great question. I think there's a time for everything, um, and there's a lot of different reasons that you might transcribe. On one hand, you might particularly be transcribing to work on your ear. Right? Or you might particularly be transcribing because you want to analyze something and you're transcribing really something really new. Um, and so I try to keep in mind the reason that I'm transcribing. Um, I think it's a great uh, oral exercise to transcribe away from the piano. There's some famous jazz musicians, Lee Connitz is a great example, who are advocates for learning to sing a solo before you write it down or even maybe never writing it down, just learning how to sing that solo. Um, for me, I think it's good to do some transcriptions without writing it down. Um, but I also really like writing it down because then I can see it and I can do the analysis part of it. You know, that whole Korea process that I showed you probably in some ways is reliant on actually being able to see it in front of you. So um, I think I'm not sure that there's like a particular right way to do it. There is this one uh, method of transcribing that I cover in at least one of my books, um, which is associated with the great pedagogue David Baker, which I think is really cool. And this method is it, to me, it's like the most intensive one that I've heard. So you learn how to sing the solo from the album, you memorize the singing the solo, and then without listening to the recording, you write it down from your own singing. So you have to be able to remember the entire thing singing it, and then you go to the piano and you see if what you're playing is matching what you're singing. To me, that's the most like intensive, difficult way to learn a solo, but man, you're really gonna connect with that solo by the time you're, you're done with that process. Uh, sometimes the more intense and, and absurd your, your method of practice, the, the the better and more ingrained it is on the other side. It's like, wow, it's like a part of me now because I went through that boot camp, I guess. Totally, yeah. I, and I think there's a time for all things. <laughs> Are you still transcribing uh, on a regular basis or do you feel like, is that something that happens earlier in a jazz player's career and you know they go beyond that and now it's, they could just hear everything? Or wh where are you at with transcribing? To me, it goes in spurts. Um, you know, I get really curious maybe about a certain album or a certain player and I, I start just like writing everything down or I have a, maybe a certain thing that I'm preparing for. Um, so for me, it goes in spurts. I, I unfortunately, I would love to be doing it on a regular basis, but I, I don't really at this point. Um, I think it's worth mentioning too that you don't always have to learn a whole solo. One thing that I love doing is just sitting at my piano with my earphones in and my, my you know, my, my music and uh, like playing an album and then stopping when I hear something interesting and trying to figure out just at the piano, you know, what, what was that lick? And then, okay, let me practice with that for 10 minutes and then press, pressing play again, stopping when I hear something else interesting and seeing if I can um, like imitate that. So it doesn't always have to be this big project that you're transcribing an entire solo. Could you just one chord? It's like, oh, every time they get to that chord, I'm like really interested. Let me figure out what that is. So yeah, it doesn't have to be a final product. R related, uh, Roy HJ, you mentioned transcribing voicings, not only melody. How do you start working on this? For example, the left-hand voicings of a pianist during an improv. I mean, our ear, even a good ear, is not always going to catch these things. What do you just play it over again? You try it both ways. Like, what? What do you do to recommend for that? Yeah. So there's. Uh, first of all, I would say if you're transcribing a piano solo, you don't always have to transcribe both hands. You can just transcribe the right hand. And there's this middle ground that a lot of pianists suggest, where you write down the top note of the voicing and the rhythm, so that you can kind of you know, you know, uh, what's the opposite of precisely? You can, imprecisely, you can vaguely. Nebulously. Nebulously. <laughs> <laughs> you can generally uh, yeah. imitate what the left yeah. hand is doing. So the top note and then just the rhythm. The proxy. Yeah. yeah. But sometimes it is nice, and especially if you're really interested in solo piano as I am, sometimes you really want to transcribe the whole arrangement. Well, we're classical pianists. We want to know exactly yeah, what we're hearing. Exactly. Yeah. So um, my advice um, would be, I think you can, 
usually aim for the top note, really try to pick out what the top note is, and then listen for the sonority of the chord, right? So, of course, whether it's major or minor, but you might also be able to hear, you know, when you have the 11th in a minor chord, it makes it sound really warm, versus when you have the 13th, it's got more crunch in it. So as you do this more and more, you're going to kind of hear some of those um, sonorities more precisely, and then you can kind of like deduce, <laughs> like, okay, I know that it's a minor chord, it's got a D on top, it's got the 11th in there, and it has the third, so it's probably something like that, right? And I've definitely done transcriptions, and you know, I'm totally unsure, or I've also done it and somebody gives me their transcription and we disagree on things, and I think that's normal. It's really, really hard to hear full piano voicings. By the way, I want to just recommend to classical pianists too. Um, this is an incredible way to just increase and enhance your musicianship. I mean, you don't, you can do it for jazz recordings, you can do it for classical recordings. I bet you don't already have every score memorized, so get your favorite, favorite pianist out, play it. Now, you won't be transcribing their solo, but you could take a passage from a Beethoven sonata or a, a Chopin piece. Oh, Chopin would be great because some of his licks are really, mm -hmm. they really are licks. And it's like, what, what exactly did he do? What you'll learn about Chopin's compositional process, his ideas, the way he's using ninths and sevenths and these things and how he creates texture is going to be much more deepened if you actually attempt to do it by ear first yeah. rather than just learn from the score. All right, all right what did he say? Okay, I'll press those buttons, press those buttons. You know, we don't, it doesn't sink in the same way. So classical musicians should be really practicing the way jazz musicians practice. It would enhance our musicianship too. I wonder if you agree with that. Yeah, and I mean the benefit, especially if you're training your ear to hear some of these chords, is you can actually check it against the score and you yeah. can see what the, you know, there there is truly a, a right answer of what it looks like. Um, but yeah, I think in my experience as a teacher, not just of jazz, but of anything, the leading defining, the, the defining characteristic of whether a student is going to be successful or not is how good their ear is. And so the more that we can do to train our ears, the more it's going to inform every other part of what we do, whether mm -hmm. it's theory, whether it's technique, um, whether it's just artistry and musicianship. Um, so yes, you are completely preaching to the choir there. And I know that, um, for those of you who, whether you celebrate Christmas or not, there's a lot of jingles that are coming up, you know, in the next couple of months. So not a bad time, you know, if you hear a little carol or a Christmas That's tune, right. those are great things to maybe just first just get the melody right, and then maybe you could, you know, start adding some things around. So somebody asked, uh, this is Linda, Autumn Leaves is a great tune to practice Korea method. What are some of your other favorite tunes? Maybe you can share another one with us. Sure. Well, um, and I will mention <laughs> that um, in Jazz Piano Fundamentals Book 1, I have a tune bank of tunes that are going to be really appropriate to practice with. And I chose those tunes because I, I said this book only uses major keys. And so all those tunes really stay in major keys. Whereas in Jazz Piano Fundamentals Book 2, go ahead, hold it up, Vanna, Vanna White here. Um, I actually give you a list with each unit of tunes that will be appropriate for that unit. Um, so, but to answer your question, um, for, especially for beginning pianists, like I said, blue, um, you want to stick with tunes mostly using major key centers. Satin Doll is a great one that uses only major key centers. I played Afternoon in Paris, which is one I often teach in classes because it only uses major key centers. Um, and uh, Tune Up is another great one that's got a ton of two five ones, really only using major key centers. So those are some really friendly ones to start with. Blues tunes are also great to start with because they're very intuitive um, and they, um, they're they not going to go probably use, using a ton of different chords. Um, they stay around the same kind of key centers the whole time. So that's another great choice is any kind of a blues tune. In jazz, some of our most popular blues tunes are written by Charlie Parker. Um, so Billy's Bounce or Now's the Time are great ones uh, to think about starting with. So I... Uh... I have a, qu a question here that I think will be a nice way to cap this okay. session off. Um, before I get there, I think maybe there's a penultimate question I could bring out here, and that's from, well, that's from Rui. This uh, this sounds like uh, definitely a classical pianist. Um, something I this is the kind of thing I I think. At what level should someone begin to experiment with jazz? Intermediate? I I think he means what level of classical yeah. proficiency technically. Um, how would you answer that? Yeah, so I often say, uh, you know, when people ask how, what level should I be at to, to start using your books, I, I say, like, uh, 
easy Bach invention level, a Chopin prelude kind mm -hmm. of a level, is a time when you're going to have enough coordination, enough music reading skill, enough technique. Early intermediate, basically. Yeah, playing the easier but real classical repertoire. Well, so then if you're a jazz, if, if you're not going through the classical track and you're a jazz pianist, what happens before this intermediate phase? Because you're not doing the same things. Classical people are always, uh, or maybe you are. I mean, what, what happens in that beginning phase for an aspiring jazz musician? Yeah, so I think often people don't really start to specialize until you're at least out of method books. So for, pretty similar. It's yeah, scales and arpeggios yeah, and simple pieces. Yeah, exactly. I mean, for me, it was about when I was 12 years old or so that my teacher, and this is actually what happened, looked at me and was like, you've got a really good ear and really bad technique. Like, <laughs> you should be a jazz pianist. Oh, no. <laughs> um, and she was, she was incredibly gracious and, you know, gave me to gave me over to a teacher that she knew. Um, but about 12 or 13, I think, is really a great age if you've already been studying piano. Um, some One way that, you know, pianists enter the jazz tradition is by learning things like pop music or church music. We have a lot of people coming from a church accompanist, church organist kind of institution, so that's not really a traditional classical training, um, but it's another way that they can really become accomplished on the piano to the point where they can start thinking about you know, all of these things that we need to do with our hands to improvise and comp and have all this coordination. There's a, there's a cute little question without any context. I'll just throw it at you before okay. the last one. Great. What about Boogie Woogie? What about Boogie Woogie? <laughs> what about it? So yeah. Boogie Woogie, I like to think of as like a, uh, a kissing cousin of jazz. <laughs> like it's not really in the jazz tradition, but it uses a lot of the same elements. So if you don't know what Boogie Woogie is, it's this really fun style where you're generally playing eight notes to the bar in the left hand. Um, and it's almost exclusively using the blues form. Um, occasionally you'll hear blue, Boogie Woogie in other kind of forms, um, but usually it's, it's using the blues form. Um, but generally, you don't hear a lot of jazz pianists playing boogie woogie, and you don't really hear a lot of boogie woogie pianists playing jazz. But boogie woogie pianists are incredible improvisers. Check out like some Mead Lux Lewis, for example. But um, I'll play you just a little bit of you know. super fun. I really like it. I get tired of it after about 15 minutes because it's kind of all the same kind of blues tradition. Now, I am in no way claiming I'm a great, great boogie woogie pianist. And when I hear the greats do it, it's pretty electrifying. Um, but it's like kind of just out on the edges of jazz. <laughs> Last question. And you hear this one asked about classical music a lot um, and it makes me re makes me realize actually jazz and classical players we have something in common and being we do <laughs> well it, you know at, at one point we didn't when when jazz I mean jazz has become a classical music in a way sure um, it's it's become a tradition it's taught in conservatories it's not always what you're hearing in the top 40 and so we do also say there's jazz here in pop really popular music standards no here um, even if it might overlap more well, what about the future of jazz? Uh, Roy H.J., what are your thoughts about the future of jazz, especially including acoustic piano? Um, it's a very interesting question, and I'm not sure that I'm the authority, but I think what's interesting and inspiring happening across the entire sphere is combinations. Like, I think, you know, jazz and classical were once very siloed, you know, and I might not have been invited on whatever the 1920 <laughs> version of tone bass was. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're, um, uh, we were integrating. Now, yeah, so, yeah, yeah, it's very, very big of you. Yes. Um, but in all seriousness, jazz and classical are crossing over. Classical and world music are crossing over. Jazz and world music are crossing over. Electronic music is infiltrating and, you know, mixing with all of these elements of jazz, rap and jazz. You know, there's this whole genre of neo-soul and pianist producer Robert Glasper kind of at the center of this movement to combine elements of, you know, hip hop and jazz. And um, so I think what's really exciting, you know, when the history books are written about jazz in this era, and I think, you know, in the next few years, a lot of it is going to be about 
um, the combination of art forms and how you know the beauty of improvising, the beauty of, of the history of jazz is starting to mix and intermingle with all these different genres. And I think that that's a really exciting possibility. Um, and at the same time, I think the piano is never going to get old <laughs> because we have all this incredible repertoire. We have all this potential and people are starting to integrate the piano with technology in all kinds of interesting ways. You know, I think about my friend Dan Tepfer as this really interesting example of, you know, using the disc clavier capables of the piano to have, you know, AI improvising, you know, beside him or to create multimedia visual presentations. And, and I might as well plug Dan's... Uh Farplay app, which he's you know using to try. Right. To, it's sort of COVID era, but you know why not? Let's jam with people who are you know across the country, and you know there's there's ways to do this with with low latency. So, but yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's I like to say that, uh, or I think the 20th century is the century of genre distinctions, mm. and I think it's you know the 21st century can really be the century in which those are broken down. They are being broken down, and technology is breaking them down. Our influences are so much more diverse no matter where we're from because of the internet and so yeah i look forward maybe maybe not i think we still feel these divides you hear jazz trained i'm classically trained but i i envision a world in which you know it's these things matter less and you get so. more and more musicians who are raised with with so many different styles that they can they can you know they can kind of do do anything at the instrument and maybe things we've never heard before which is the most exciting part is the ways in which these might um, you know, t transform into sounds that, you know, we haven't imagined yet. Yeah, I think they, they certainly already are. And, you know, Brad Meldow comes to mind as the example of, you know, this future pianist. Mm -hmm. um, and I know at, the, at this point he's not the youngest person in the world, but, you know, he's doing, uh, he's doing these incredible traditional jazz tours. He's on tour with Joshua Redman right now. He's writing leader to perform with Renee Fleming. He's collaborating with chamber orchestras on new compositions. And then he's going and playing duo with John Mayer. And he's recording Radiohead. And he just made an electronic album called Finding Gabriel. And he's just kind of doing it all. And I think the piano, you know, is still this, the center of, of everything. And it's still, you know, mastery of this instrument allows us to do so many different things. Um, and this isn't changing. It's like the bicycle. We, we perfected <laughs> it. We don't need to change the uh, the engineering here. Uh, actually, if you could do an encore uh, question, because I realized I forgot about her. Sure. Or I don't know if it's her. Auntie BK. Um, do you use any Barry Harris methods, RIP? Uh, and how would you go about implementing them? They, they say that they they like them a lot. Um, so maybe a word on Barry Harris and his you know harmonic ideas. Yeah, so Barry Harris is one of the geniuses and most influential jazz pianist, um, but an incredible and generous, generous educator mm -hmm. as well. And what's really fantastic is that you can find so many of his materials archived just on YouTube yep. and, and elsewhere. So um, I'm not sure that I have like a particular amount um, I'm familiar with with a, a lot of what he's done. And I think it's all it's all like good stuff. I'm not sure that I have anything like particular to comment on um, in terms of Barry Harris other than that, like, Yes, he, he is this in, invaluable, even even as he's passed, he continues to be one of the most valuable resources in jazz education. So um, plug, yeah, go, go check out Barry Harris's videos. There's a lot of great, awesome little master classes with him from Lincoln Center filmed maybe 10, 15 years ago on YouTube that are just, they blew my mind. I mean, he was talking about what I thought I knew music theory, but he was talking about it in a way that just made me see it from a whole new perspective. So again, we, we, coming from different traditions, we musicians should uh, really learn from each other. So thank you so much for stopping by. This My pleasure. This won't be the last time. Okay. And it won't be the last time that this channel, which mostly posts <laughs> classical content, is also going to diversify, expand, um, because, you know, we are all one species here. And uh, we all, you know, music is, is, it really comes from the same shared soul, I think. And so the more that we can, we can uh, trade ideas and secrets, uh, the, the better. So thank you, Jeremy. And one last plug. Sure. Let's show all three. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, so the new book is Jazz Piano Fundamentals. This is more for intermediate jazz pianists. If you want to get to that intermediate level, Jazz Piano Fundamentals book one. Um, it's really just taking you by the hand if you haven't played jazz at all. And if you're a little bit more experienced in solo piano, is your, uh, your interest playing solo jazz piano is um, a book I'm really proud of. Uh, you can get them all at jeremysiskin.com. Um, and uh, I'd really appreciate the invitation. Thanks. Thanks so much. Absolutely. And uh, one last plug. 
we, there's other ways to improvise. You can improvise historical uh, styles as well and classical styles. And next week, there will be a live stream on this channel with the great Noam Savan, one of the great classical improvisers of our time, although he can also improvise in, in modern and contemporary styles. So check that out. It'll be on YouTube as well as the uh, tone based platform and Noam is remarkable. He's a tone based artist and he's the first, from what I understand, to start a program that teaches uh, historical improvisation at a conservatory in Stuttgart. I don't know of this degree except where he teaches. So excited to hear about that and um, thank you so much for joining us, Jeremy. You as well.